in, in the last class, I have discussed about uh, various uh, geophysical exploration. So, uh, and today in this class, I will discuss about uh, the bearing capacity of shallow foundation and what are the different types of shallow foundation, how we will calculate the bearing capacity and other factors related to the bearing capacities. Now, before I start uh, today's topic, so last class I have discussed about the different types of geophysical exploration. The first one seismic reflection survey and where we can determine the thickness of uh, soil layer and the velocity of the wave and I have already discussed how this wave uh, can be generated whether it is a shear wave or the primary wave or the P wave and then we can determine the velocity and the thickness of the soil layer. But this uh, method has uh, several limitations that here we have to determine or we have to uh, note the travel time of two rays, one is direct ray, another is the reflected rays and here this method is suitable, suitable for the homogeneous soil. Now, if there is a um, uh, layer soil and determination of the two different waves are sometimes very difficult, then we go for the seismic refraction survey, which is more popular compared to the seismic reflection survey. So, here we can determine the thickness of n number of layers and we can determine the velocity of the number of layers. So, here, uh, so this is the uh, different refract, refracted and the direct rays and we, are, we will get ultimately by using n number of geophones this type of curve. So, slope of this curve will give uh, 1 by V p 1, then the slope of this curve will give 1 by V p 2 then this one will give 1 by V p 3. So, this I have discussed the how I will get uh, these expressions and then these are the different refract refracted rays and the direct rays and there is a term that is the x c which is critical distance and so, so, this is the critical distance. So, if we place geophone in between the critical distance from the source, then the direct ray will reach first and if, if we place the geophones beyond the critical distance, then the refracted ray will reach first to the geophone and here the advantage of this method is that here we can, we are determining the first arrival wave travel time. So, that is very easy to identify and if there is a three layer system, then uh, we will get another critical distance. So, this is also x c. So, this is x c 1, this is x c 2. So, x c 1 means if I can, uh, uh, take this wave and this wave. So, if I place geophone within the x c 1, then the direct ray from A to C will reach first and then if I place geophone beyond the x c 1, but within the x c 2, then this refracted ray will reach first. But if I place geophone beyond the x c 2, then this refracted ray will reach first as the primary condition of this test is that V p 3 should be greater than V p 2 should be greater than V p 1. So, that is why as we will go in the uh, deeper layers, so velocity of the wave will increase. So, there is a possibility the refracted ray will reach first. Now, uh, this is the primary condition of this test and another one that if I want to cover more depth, then you have to increase the distance of the geophone from the source. So, and we have to satisfy this condition. If this condition is not satisfying, then we will not get the proper result. Now, but most of the cases we satisfy this condition, that is why this is most uh, popular uh, seismic refraction survey, but because here uh, uh, with very less time we can complete the survey. But if we do not get this type of uh, condition in the soil layer, then you have to go for
seismic cross hole survey. So, where we have to go for the borehole and then we place geophone and the receive, uh, source and the uh, receiver and we measure the time uh, interval and the distance then we directly get the uh, velocity. So, the problem is that here we have to go for the borehole. So, which is more time consuming and but if we uh, do not have the soil condition which is required for the seismic refraction test then you have to go for this survey because here the velocity increasing decreasing does not matter because here we are going for the borehole. And so, next one that we will discuss about the foundation. So, now uh, last two weeks or the last 10 lectures we have discussed that how we will determine the soil properties. Now, with the help of uh, laboratory testing and of in situ test. Now, here how we will use those soil properties for determination of bearing capacity of a foundation or the settlement of a foundation and then how we will design the foundation. So, before I go for the design part, so now the what is foundation? Now, foundation is that part of structure which is which transfers the load from the superstructure to the soil or the subsoil. So, that means, here it will transfer the load from the soil uh, structure to the soil. So, to design the foundation, we should know what are the loads coming from the superstructure and what are the subsoil properties. So, these are very important. So, now the foundation it is uh, generally two types one is the shallow foundation another is the deep foundation. So, here you can say the shallow foundation is defined as if the depth of foundation is less than equal to the width of foundation. So, this is a typical foundation where d is the d f is the depth of foundation. So, this is the base of foundation. So, the depth of foundation is the depth from the ground surface to the base of foundation and width of foundation is the b. So, now if it is satisfying this condition then this is called as a shallow foundation. Now, in other way deep foundation is that that means, if the depth of foundation is greater than the width of foundation. So, but if it is within the 15 uh, 1 to the 15 if it is greater than 1, but less than equal to 15 then it is called moderately deep, but if it is uh, greater than 15 then it is called the deep foundation. So, now in this uh, lecture I will discuss about the shallow foundation and then the coming lectures I will discuss about the deep foundation also. Now, the shallow foundations are in different types. So, these are the I will discuss what are the different types of shallow foundation. The first type is the steep footing or the continuous footing. So, that means you can see this is a photograph of a steep footing where the, the length of the footing is much greater than the width of the footing. So, this is the typical steep uh, foundation steep footing where you can see the length of the footing is much greater than the width of the footing. So, because this is the width of the footing this direction this is the length of the footing. Now, where it is been used? So, it is been provided for load bearing wall. So, this is the example of a typical load bearing wall which is the continuous type of uh, foundation. So, here length is much higher than the width of the footing. Now, it is also provided for a low up column which are cosily, cosily spaced and their footings overlap each other. Now, if, if you have a uh, very cosily spaced row of columns, then uh, if I provide the footing for each column, then there is a possibility that the each footing may overlap. So, that means, one footing may overlap to the another one. So, instead of going for individual footing in that case, then we can go for a long footing or that in that where the length of the footing is much higher than the width of the footing. So, that type of foundation is called the uh, steep footing or the continuous footing. Next one is the spread footing or the isolated footing. Now, you can see the these are the different um, uh, one square type of uh, uh, spread footing. So, this spread footing can be circular, can be square or rectangular. So, here the photographs is showing it is a 
particular square type of spray footing with different uh, uh, type of uh, uh, arrangement or you can say this is a simple one, this is a slope type of arrangement or this is a step type of arrangement, but all the cases it is the isolated footing. So, each footing is given under a particular column. So, here there is no overlap and there is a particular clear spacing between the two footing. So, this is that is why it is provided to support an individual column and as I mentioned it can be circular square or rectangular. And the next one is the combined footing. So, when the we provide a footing for more than one column. So, here this combined footing is provided for two columns. So, here this can be different shape, it can be in triangular form, it can be in the rectangle um, uh, trapezoidal form depending upon. So, the site requirement. So, we can provide the footing for more than one column. So, that type of footing is called the combined footing. So, this is the typical photograph or the figure of a particular combined footing. Then the next one is the mat or the raft foundation. So, the large slab supporting number of columns and wall under the entire structure is called the raft or the mat foundation. So, you can see, so this one particular one footing is provided for the entire column covering the all the walls or the columns that is coming on the soil. So, that means the from the superstructure the all the columns we are covering under a single footing. So, this is a large slab. So, you can see this is the large slab which is covering all the columns. So, this type of foundation is called the raft foundation. So, basically here in this course I will design uh, isolated footing and raft footing both. So, and, the, and then we can discuss about the strip footing and we can discuss about the combined footing also. So, in the shallow foundation part, I will mainly discuss these four types of footing that is the strip footing, spread footing either circular, square or rectangular or combined footing uh, and combined footing and the raft foundation and the design procedure design guidelines are different for different kinds of footing. So, and this type of footing has an advantage also because here we are taking the entire structure as under a one particular uh, footing. So, when uh, if I provide a isolated footing, uh, footing under a single column, then there is a possibility then we have some differential settlement. I mean settlement and the different part of the uh, structure may be different for different footing because your load is not same or throughout the structure. Soil condition may different from one side to another side of the building. So, there is a possibility of the differential settlement. Now, if we have the excessive differential settlement, then if I provide this type of foundation, then those that settlement differential settlement also can be prevented because here we are taking the entire load under a footing and entire columns under a footing and then we are because this is a rigid type of footing. So, isolated footing is a flexible type of footing and if you are providing the wrap with entire all the columns then this is a rigid type of footing. So, we are providing so rigid rigidity that is why the possibility of the differential settlement will also be reduced. So, next one is the choice of a particular type of foundation. So, that means as I mentioned we have discussed about the different types of foundation shallow foundations. So, then which one we will choose that depends on the, the how much loading is coming from the uh, superstructure, then the subsoil properties, then the nature of the superstructure and specific requirement. So, sometimes for the specific requirements also we have to choose the footing uh, in, in the combined footing that we cannot go for uh, beyond, beyond the edge of the column in certain uh, distance because of the restriction, then we have to go, we have to design our footing in that way. So, in that way we will decide based on these four factors that we will decide whether we will go for the isolated footing or we will go for the uh, um, combined footing because if we have 
because the loading is one major factor and the soil properties are the also major factor. So, if, uh, later on when I design all these things, so you will uh, see that, that based on these uh, uh, properties, we have to decide which type of footing we will consider. So, next one the, now when you design a particular footing, so there are two basic design criteria. So, one is the bearing capacity criteria or the shear failure criteria, another is the settlement criteria. So, that when you design the footing, you have to keep in mind that our, uh, the footing that I am designing, it should capable to take the load that is coming from the superstructure and at the same time, there should not be uh, excessive amount of settlement in the footing. So, that means, you have to take care of two things. One is the bearing capacity, that means, your foundation can carry that load which is coming from the superstructure and then there should not be any excessive settlement. And we have to check these two criteria separately and then you have to decide that what would be the amount of load you can put on that particular loading or vice versa for a particular loading what would be the dimension or depth of foundation for a particular footing. And these are the two criteria. Criteria. In addition to that, uh, there is a depth criteria. So we, you should know where you will place your foundation. So uh, for example, uh, as per the IS core recommendation, that we we have to provide at least 50 centimeter or 500 millimeter depth of the foundation. So that means your DF, that depth of the foundation, DF cannot be less than point. 5 meter. So, that is the minimum depth required of a foundation. The reason is that you, you cannot uh, place the foundation in a very shallow depth. So, uh, because we have to provide at least 500 millimeter or 0.5 meter depth below the ground level. So, because as uh, if the, there is a water flow or then when the soil above the foundation can wash away. So, if I provide a very, very small depth uh, above the foundation. So, this is the recommend, minimum recommend as per the IS code. In addition to that, then <coughs> later on we'll, uh, uh, when, during the design, you can find that where I will place the foundation. So, if you have a, a layered soil, then you have to design that, decide where I will place the foundation. Suppose, if you have a very soft soil and then uh, uh, hard soil, then it is better to place the foundation on the hard soil rather than the soft soil, because then you will get the more bearing capacity. So, those things will be decided. So, that is why the depth criteria is also uh, important thing that where I will place the foundation, but the major two criteria is the bearing capacity and the settlement. Now, as I mentioned that uh, the bearing capacity foundation uh, criteria. Now, that the foundation should be designed such that the soil below does not fail in shear. So, that means as I mentioned that we have to design the foundation such that the, the foundation can take that load. The, it means that this foundation is transferring the load which is coming from the superstructure to the soil. So, when you apply the load on the soil, so the soil will shear. So, and there is a possibility that the fail, shear failure will occur, because soil always fails in shear. So, whenever we apply the load, there is a possibility the shear failures will occur. So, that means, each soil has its own load carrying capacity or the strength carrying capacity, uh, stress carrying capacity based on the strength of the soil. So, and this the strength uh, parameters as I mentioned in the uh, third lecture that the C phi cohesion and the friction, these are the two strength uh, parameters. So, based on the strength of the soil, each soil has its stress carrying capacity. Now, the stress which is coming from the uh, foundation to the soil, if more than the strength of the soil, then it will fail. So, and it will fail in shear. So, that means, we have to design the foundation such that the soil will not fail in shear. So, what are the loads actually uh, is coming on the soil? So, one load Q c which is coming from the superstructure through a column to the foundation and from the foundation to the soil. Now, in addition to that, 
there are other loads that is also acting that this is our uh, foundation and uh, below the ground this is the ground level and below the ground this is the foundation. So, Q c is acting from the superstructure then W f is the weight of the foundation or footing itself that is also coming on the uh, soil and the weight of the soil because this portion. So, when we construct the foundation so the initially this is our uh, uh, virgin soil now you uh, we have to excavate this portion of the soil for the construction purpose. So, we will remove this soil excavate this soil construct the foundation then again we will fill this portion of the soil. So, the total weight which is coming here is the summation of these three the, the load which is coming from the superstructure weight of the foundation itself and the weight of this fill. So, that is the gross amount of load which is acting on the base of the footing or the soil. So, the total gross load is Q c plus W f plus W s, s is the weight of the soil or fill. So, now if I divide this total load with the area of the foundation. So, if there is a B into L, if the B is the width of the foundation, L is the length of the foundation, then this will be the area of the foundation. So, if I divide it by the area of the foundation, then we will get the gross pressure of the uh, that is coming on the soil. So, this is Q capital Q G is the gross load and small Q G is the gross pressure, pressure because we are dividing the gross load by the area. Now, this is the gross load and in addition to that we have different terminology that we will use frequently. So, uh, first explain what are these different terminology because in the bearing capacity one I have discussed about the gross pressure. The next one is the ultimate bearing capacity Q u. So, what is ultimate bearing capacity? Ultimate bearing capacity is the maximum gross intensity of loading that soil can support before it fails in shear. So, that means, this is the maximum gross stress or gross uh, pressure that is acting on a soil before it is fail. So, that is the ultimate bearing capacity Q u, then the net ultimate bearing capacity. So, as uh, I have mentioned that if this is the virgin soil, so and this is the depth of the foundation or the depth where you placed your foundation. So, initially there were stress of this soil because this overburden stress were there. Now, when due to the excavation we are removing this portion of the soil. So, we are removing this portion of the soil. So, basically we initially we are releasing the stress over this base. Now, we are constructing the soil uh, foundation, then the load is uh, coming from the superstructure total uh, uh, then the total load is the superstructure load, then the load of the um, uh, foundation itself and then when there will be construction then we will fill this portion with again soil. So, these are the total gross, but the this base is sub is uh, subjected to the pressure which is not the gross pressure because initially there was a overburden pressure due to the soil. So, the net pressure that or net stress this soil is subjected is the ultimate load or the gross load minus the gamma into d f. So, the gamma is the unit weight of the soil. So, this gamma into d f were initially there on the soil. Now, because of the excavation you are removing that. Now, we are applying the total load which is the gross load. So, the net load will be the ultimate bearing capacity minus gamma into d f because this gamma into d f initially was there. So, that is the net load which is the weight of the superstructure load 
uh, weight of the footing plus the load which is coming from the superstructure. So, that much of the net load we can apply on the soil because the gamma df were always initially there. So, as the superstructure and the foundation load that will be the net load. So, the net load the, the net uh, ultimate bearing capacity will be the ultimate bearing capacity minus gamma into df. Then the next one is the net safe bearing capacity. So, the maximum the definition is that so the maximum net intensity of loading that soil can safely support without a risk of failure. So, there is the net bearing capacity is the maximum net intensity of loading at the base of the foundation that soil can su support before it shear, but here we have not applied any factor of safety. So, that means that if we apply some factor of safety then the net ultimate will become the net safe bearing capacity. So, that means we are applying some safety factor. So, that is why if I divide it with that net ultimate uh, bearing capacity by a factor f, this f is called the factor of safety. Generally, this value is taken as 2.523 in case of bearing capacity calculation. So, this is the range that we will use as a uh, factor of safety when you calculate the load carrying capacity or the bearing capacity of the soil. Next one is the gross safe bearing capacity. So, now the gross safe bearing capacity is the maximum gross intensity of loading that soil can uh, safely take without failing the shear. So, that means here what is gross safe bearing capacity? So, gross safe bearing capacity we have the net uh, safe bearing capacity. So, net safe bearing capacity is the load that is coming due to the uh, footing load and the superstructure load. So, but soil can take the overburden pressure also. So, that is the net if I uh, add that overburden pressure. So, then that will be the gross load. So, or the gross capacity. So, that is the thing this is the net uh, safe this is actually the this is the Q net safe, this is the q net safe, then plus gamma d f. So, this net safe is net ultimate divided by factor of safety and net ultimate is q u minus gamma d f divided by factor of safety plus gamma d f. So, when you uh, we are calculating the bearing capacity there are different uh, form of bearing capacity. So, we have discussed that. So, if you have to express them in that form which is been asked to determine. So, that means there is a gross ultimate load carrying capacity, then net ultimate load carrying capacity or bearing capacity, then net safe bearing capacity, then the gross safe bearing capacity. So, these are the four terms which will be very useful and we will use them frequently. Then, so these four terms that I have discussed it is in terms of shear failure or the bearing capacity failure, but in terms of settlement there is a, another term which is called safe bearing pressure. So, the, the maximum net intensity loading that can be allowed on the soil without the settlement exceeding the permissible value. So, as I mentioned that every foundation we are designing with a permissible settlement. So, the uh, different code has given the permissible settlement. So, we have to follow the code who under which we are designing the foundation. So, the, the maximum net intensity remember that is the net intensity or the net intensity of loading that is allowed on the foundation. So, that there should not be a settlement 
which is beyond the permissible one. So, that load or is or the pressure is called the safe bearing pressure. So, that means here we have two criteria based on the two criteria uh, we, we have the uh, pressure one is the in terms of uh, bearing capacity or in terms of settlement. Now, then the next one is very interesting that is the allowable bearing pressure that means how much stress we can allow on the soil. So, this allowable bearing pressure is the minimum of these two criteria. That means, the pressure that we can apply on a soil, the minimum pressure that you can apply on a soil in terms of bearing capacity criteria or in terms of the settlement criteria and the minimum of these two. That means, the maximum pressure that we are applying on a soil in terms of bearing capacity criteria and the settlement criteria and minimum of these two will give you the allowable bearing pressure. That means, the maximum net intensity of loading that can be imposed on the soil with no possibility of shear failure or the possibility of excessive settlement. It is the smaller of net safe bearing capacity in terms of shear failure criteria and the safe bearing pressure in terms of settlement criteria. So, that means, it is the smaller of the net safe bearing capacity. So, we have discussed among these four this there is the net safe bearing capacity in terms of shear failure criteria and then the safe bearing pressure in terms of settlement criteria. So, small so the smaller of these two will be the allowable bearing pressure. So, when we determine this thing, when we design this foundation, we will use this allowing uh, bearing pressure and then this allowing bearing pressure is the maximum intensity that that we can the intensity of load that we can apply on a soil in terms of bearing, uh, uh, bearing failure criteria and the maximum intensity of load we can apply in terms of settlement criteria, then minimum of these two will give me the allowable bearing pressure. Another thing I want to mention that in terms of when you are talking about bearing criteria, we have applied a factor of safety f, but when you are talking about the settlement criteria, we are not applying a factor of safety, because here we are determining this in terms of a permissible settlement value. So, here the settlement value is given, we cannot exceed that settlement value during our design. So, factor of safety we apply on bearing capacity not in the settlement, because here we are design the load based on a particular permissible settlement. So, these are the all terminology. So, next class I will discuss how I will determine the bearing capacity of a soil. First, I will discuss the bearing capacity uh, criteria, then I will discuss the settlement criteria. So, first in the next class, I will discuss how we will determine the bearing capacity of the soil, what are the different theories are developed to determine the bearing capacity and what are the difference between them and how we will determine the bearing capacity of a soil. Thank you.